Gus and I went to Geneva with Jeremy Wallington, head of the investigative unit of World Nation at that time, to try and sell a submarine to a man called Pierre Lorez, who was one of these illicit French arms dealers. And we rigged up Gus with a, a, a radio mic and a fountain pen in his pocket and sat him in the lounge of this hotel with Jeremy. Jeremy was Captain Hamilton and Gus was his trusty assistant, Jock. And they duly pitched the submarine to him and I and the crew sat in a, in a car outside and tried to film through the window what was going on. We had one alarming moment. We thought he had spotted our camera. The reporters turned round, but in fact his eye had merely been caught by a car rocking in the gale. I think one of the most extraordinary world in actions of, uh, of the time, I remember sitting in a, a darkened uh, viewing room and waiting for these rushes to come through, and uh, it was Brian Moser who had been in Bolivia when Che Guevara was killed, and he again was a man with a, a will like a laser. You had these very heavy uh, army thugs with guns beating everybody in sight, but... Uh, Moser had that wonderful English uh, public school by quality where he, you know, get out of my way, way my mind, I have my duty to do. And uh, he'd gone straight in there and taken photographs. There seems absolutely no doubt at all that this is Che Guevara. Uh, look, yes, they're now sitting Che Guevara up, actually sitting him up. Uh, his dead body is now being sat up. It's the most fantastic sight. He's a very pale, ghastly, ghostly yellow colour. Now his head has rolled back onto the stretcher in which he was brought in. His eyes are still open. Balls of his eyes sticking out at you. And now they're lifting his head up by his long hair again, coming right back. The smell of formalin here is quite oh, yeah, terrible. Uh, the smell of formalin. You can hardly the get near the body of Che Guevara for this ghastly smell which makes your eyes smart. In fact, I ran out of film and... Uh, um, at that time, the most amazing moment of all happened, of course. I had no film. They actually, to show that it was Che Guevara, they actually sat his body up, facing this crowd of local campesinos, peasants, who were in, in Valle Grande. And then we were, well, the, then the, the, the soldiers came at us with their bayonets, as I said. And I had a little tiny tape recorder. Luckily, I managed to record what was going on as it was happening. Well, I've already taken this like him They're not telling us to get out of it. They're taking all the people away. Che Guevara is being held up by his hair again. It's a terrible sight. His eyes are rolling. Now that the army are telling him to get away, army officers standing all around the body, a corporal holding him up by his head, and now his head's rolled back onto the stretcher. We've got a girl. They're coming at us with the rifle butt now. They're coming at us with the rifle butt. No more than father, leave us to Santo, amen. World in Action was not only covering revolutions abroad, but at home too. The program's film of the 1968 Grosvenor Square demonstration against the Vietnam War was a striking example of its work. It was also a time of revolution in film technology, the new lightweight cameras giving far greater mobility. I once saw one of those cameras with a sticker on it at a student demo in the late 60s, and the sticker on it was one that I'd seen on Fender Stratocasters. It said, this machine kills fascists, it had written on the side of it. A wonderfully dated sort of hippie gesture that captures the spirit of the way that new equipment made us all feel about being able to run with the stories. There was also a crossover, I think, between World in Action team and the, the kind of rock and roll territory of the late 60s. A colleague of mine, a World in Action producer called Joe Durden-Smith, conned David Plowright into some fantastic and beautifully argued gobbledygook about how the, the modes and styles of late 60s rock and roll were highly political how the Doors in particular were making profound political statements. I remember coming across Plowright in his office one lunchtime trying to decode the lyrics of a Jim Morrison song, um, quite futilely, since nobody can hear what Jim's singing about, splendid though he is. You know we gotta get it all together. <laughs>
Like many of their contemporaries, the Doors show more clearly what they're against rather than what they're for. This film is an attempt to illustrate their report on the state of the world. The Doors' message is uncompromisingly loud. Please do not adjust your set. Get together. fascinating to look at now the stones in the park because it's kind of shamelessly of its time it's really a piece of social history rather than a documentary and i include the absurdities of its editing style all my own fault the the six frame cuts the 20 to 1 crash zooms and all that goes with it but it is so um sort of redolent of the kind of foolish excesses of the late 60s it, it, i still find it a rather charming thing to to watch <laughs> In the 60s, there was a great deal of uh, attack in Granada. The, the whole uh, mood of the times was to give young people an opportunity and to sweep away the sort of fuddy-duddy nature of old-fashioned uh, television. And um, having inherited that kind of radical northern tradition, which was very anti-London and against the establishment, they had slogans like, um, we must uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. World in Action continued to show that if there was a major problem in making a program, they would solve it, even if it meant inventing a new form. Grigorenko has managed to smuggle out from prison to his wife a detailed diary of his experiences since his arrest in May last year. It has now reached the West through an underground route of established reliability. Drama documentary for me at Granada grew specifically out of World in Action and out of some quite precise program frustrations we had in the late 60s. At that time we were um, lavishly covering the misdemeanors of the Americans in Vietnam, usually with the good officers of the American Information Service who'd fly you anywhere in a helicopter to say very rude things about what they were doing. But we couldn't do anything in Eastern Europe because they wouldn't let us in. Soviet David Bolton and I did a, our most ambitious drama doc about the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, which I guess I still feel was the most successful of those pieces. Your troops have just shot a young boy, a child, because he waved a flag, that's why. When the Czech Revolution happened in 89, the Velvet Revolution, we were able to take that program back and show it to Alexander Dubček himself with the actor Julian Glover who played him in the drama doc. Um, that was a spooky and surreal experience. There's a scene in, in Invasion that we'd always been challenged about and always been, frankly, ourselves a little skeptical about. Um, the scene is in the Kremlin. Dubček and the Czech delegation are sitting at a long table and in March Brezhnev and his bunch of geriatric ghouls to browbeat them and they goose step into the room in perfect military formation um, in a truly sinister column. Our informant had told us that was what had happened. We showed it to Dubček and he said, I mean, he said that, believe it or not, that is exactly what happened. We decided that socialism was nothing without a human face. Ours was a revolutionary experiment, comrades. And... and... You me. And My throat I choked up. supported you against Novotny. I spoke up for you when some of our comrades criticized you. No, 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 I said. Our Sasha is a good man. 
He would have strung me up. The 1970s were a comparatively quiet time for Granada as the company and its chairman advanced into late middle age. Sidney Bernstein became more involved in the business side of the Granada group, giving Dennis Foreman and David Plowright a free hand to run the broadcasting side. The company's major achievements in this period were in the field of drama. Popular series with a northern setting such as Family at War and Sam. The prestigious Laurence Olivier Presents and the single drama made on film. Ready? Good morning. Good morning. A few pearls of wisdom from one who knows. What we're now about to witness is called a football match. Not the beginning of World War III, not the destruction of the human race. A football match. In it, each of the teams will attempt to score more goals than the other. What are you looking at? Not much. That will be done by kicking the ball in the net as opposed to kicking other people in the crutch. Right. Great. Thank you. People like Jack Rosenthal, John Finch, Arthur Hopcraft, you know, Colin Welland, all these people who were writing with their roots in the North were given a chance to express themselves and I suppose the presiding genius of that was Peter Eckersley who for a crucial period ran Granada's drama department and not only was Peter putting these North Country writers their voice onto film but he was now putting the North of England onto film. Mark it. Two, four, one, take six. Sorry. My mind. Cut! No, sorry. Action! No, sorry. Yes, that's right. Action! Well, thanks for the lift. Thank you. No, no. What the hell is it? An earthquake? The end of the world? In the 70s, commercial television was making a very great deal of money. It was also on its very best behaviour. It had demonstrated that it could do the things at which the BBC had traditionally thought to be better as well as, if not better than, the BBC could do. It then became possible, on the back of the prosperity of the 70s, to go for broke and do uh, the most wonderful drama series that one could mount. Charles, they such a tourist. It doesn't matter when it was built, it's pretty. It's the sort of thing that interests me. Oh dear. I thought I'd cured you of all that. The terrible Mr. Collins. Hmm? Sebastian in his wheelchair, spinning down the box-edged walks of the kitchen gardens in search of alpine strawberries and warm figs, propelling himself through the succession of hothouses, from scent to scent and climate to climate, to choose orchids for our buttonholes. It was given an original budget, which it enormously exceeded, I'm sad and regretful to say, but it, it was, again, a, a, an extraordinary pioneering effort because nobody had, uh, until that time, done anything so ambitious, not only all on film, but shot entirely on location and uh, for 13 hours of, of, of actually cut film. Well, that's four times a very large movie. 